Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of, you know, stay at home is kind of getting getting tired. We need a new name. So please, in the chat, tell me what this is another edition of um, a Jacobin talk, a Jacobin lecture, something something like that. Uh, my name is Bastia Sankara. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin. And almost every week, I've been joined by a left-wing thinker to talk about an idea for around a half hour, sometimes a bit less. Uh, then we've been doing Q&A with our audience, so please leave your chats in YouTube and the Facebook chat and whatever, and we'll we'll get to it for the for the Q&A. Today is a little bit unusual because I'll be doing the talk myself, um, and I'll be joined by my good friend Asher Deploy Spencer, who's a Verso editor, and he'll be leading the Q&A the discussion. So he'll have the to struggle to get through internet comments to find the gems, but there's always gems because you're great people. Some of the best, some would say. I have faith. Um, I, I have faith as well. Uh, but today I'll be talking about social democracy. I'll be doing this as a little bit more of a historical talk because when I was outlining it, I'm like, this should really be six talks. And there's lots of, of really important questions that I won't be able to get to in detail. So what I want to do is just pose them as broad questions. We can get to some of them that interest you in the Q&A. If not, this can just be a starting point, uh, not an end-all, be-all sort of lecture. I also want to plug that on Friday, we're going to have a great uh, roundtable on Podemos. We have a lot of great Jacobin contributors. We have a lot of great comrades from Spain who are staying up late at 6 p.m. Eastern on Friday to, to talk about Podemos. And we're back next week, too, on Monday, on Wednesday, on Friday. We're going to be back to doing these every um at at least two three times a week and this week on saturday we do not have an edition of, of weekends obviously we're still just picking up the pieces and we're still mourning our, our good friend michael brooks but uh we will be continuing a broadcast uh of, of weekends in the the future so stay tuned and please support the show uh starting next uh saturday so uh asher i guess kale's <laughs> gonna have to awkwardly cut you back out of the screen so uh, I promise to be brief. I promise that in a half an hour, you could um, yell at me for things that I'm missing and correct me for anything I got wrong. But in the meantime, I guess I'll just start. And I actually want to start with a photo. And, you know, Kale's going to dig up this photo, but it, it really, I think, is an important part of the history of socialism and of history of the workers' movement. I know it's not much to look at, but this is a photo from a 1907 Social Democratic Party of Germany, Marxist theory school. It was instructed by Rosa Luxemburg. You could see her standing on the left. You'd also see Wilhelm Pick, um, who is seated to the right of Luxembourg, and Friedrich Ebert, who's on the third row in the back, somewhere on the, the left-hand side of the right row. Um, so Ebert, a social Demo democrat, uh, helmed the pre-war Weimar Republic. Uh, Pick became the president of East Germany after World War II, the DDR. And Rosa Luxemburg, the great revolutionary, as you all know, was captured and executed after the failed Spartacist uprising in January 1919. Ebert, in many ways, is responsible for her, for her death. And this photo to me is just a vital reminder that what we understand is three distinct traditions came out of the unified workers' movement of the 19th century and the early 20th century. The social democratic, the state socialist, and the revolutionary socialists uh, all have had their own complex histories afterwards, but they have this common ancestor. And what I want to do in my talk today is discuss social democracy as being an integral part of the social tradition that merits our time and attention, even if we're going to review it critically, even though we're critical of, of the tradition. Uh, so I try to avoid in my work the no true Scotsman uh, kind of fallacy, where you say that uh, libertarians often do this. They often say, well, you could talk to a libertarian and tell them, you know, the system is terrible. We, we don't have health care. We have uh, tremendous amounts of joblessness and homelessness. There's all these inadequacies. And I can tell libertarian, this is why capitalism is so, so unfair. This is why capitalism is so unjust. And they'll say, yes, 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 the system isn't working. 
And the problem is it's not capitalism. You know, if real capitalism would be perfect, and this isn't real capitalism. This is some sort of corporatist, whatever they want to describe it, crony capitalism, they have all sorts of euphemism. And sometimes on the left, we do the same thing. We say that, you know, these systems, the Soviet Union, uh, Scandinavia, you know, these aren't uh, in any way related to the socialist tradition because they're bad, they're flawed in some ways. Uh, therefore, they're not socialism because what socialism is, is socialism is good. And I'll know socialism when I see it because it'll be, it'll be good. And that might work in a polemical sense, but I think intellectually it leads us astray. So what I'll do today is a short history of social democracy, talk about what it was, what it became, and then talk about what social dem uh, class struggle social democracy, the mold of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, uh, and of course their successors, I mean today. Uh, in other words, I want us to help, uh, I want to help us understand social democracy beyond just a, a, a pejorative. So I don't have much time to go into the early history. Obviously, I laid out a really, really big prompt for myself. So here's the gist. The 19th century, of course, was the most transformative century probably in human history. You, know, you have countries like Germany going through mass industrialization. You have the emergence of an even more powerful uh, uh, capitalist class, and along with it, a working class that's increasingly concentrated in big cities and more and more aware of its class position. So this early workers' movement is, is fighting for economic and social rights. Uh, but in most places also fighting for basic political rights and democracy as well. So there was this organic understanding, of course, of, of its class position, but it took con conscious political organizing to band the class together, especially in the wake of the failed 1848 revolution, which showed a generation of early socialists, it showed people like Marx that they couldn't rely on the bourgeoisie to even be partners or allies uh, in the fight for democracy it really dispelled this notion of the liberal bourgeoisie. So Ferdinand Lassalle, even though he was criticized by Marx and Engels, was a really important figure in this early class organizing in Germany. And he was a guy who lived a, a quite bizarre and interesting life. Uh, perhaps we could do a separate talk on him. But the key thing to know about Lassalle and his influence is that Lassalleanism is generally criticized by Marxists for two reasons. Now, one, is its view of the state. Uh, LaSalle saw the state as autonomous rather than an instrument of class rule. This led him to be drawn towards really weird cross-class alliances, like him wanting the Kaiser's help uh, against the bourgeoisie and, and, and for the creation of some sort of welfare state uh, um, uh, supported by, by the old, um, uh, aristocratic elements against the bourgeoisie and the interests of workers. It also had a belief in an iron law of wages, which you can't really get into, but the idea was that nothing could prevent wages from falling below subsistence levels. And this led LaSalle and later his disciples. It also led kind of the SLP in the Daniel de Leon days to downplay the possibility for trade union victories within, within capitalism. So in Germany, even when the Marxists and the Salians uh, got into the same organizations. Marx famously criticized their Gotha program uh, for its uh, Lasallian flavor. But these early attempts were about taking a class that existed objectively within capitalism, the working class, and connecting it to a set of political and social demands rooted in its class position. Uh, that naturally had a subjective political program. So it took feats of adaption. It, it, it took on sometimes really weird forms where a lot of the, the social base for these early parties were artisans, they were craftsmen, they weren't the traditional industrial proletariat, at least initially. Now politics, in other words, created this workers' movement. It wasn't mandated to be by objective conditions and, and neither were labor parties as those of us living in the United States know so well, because we haven't even had a bad social democratic labor party to betray us. Uh, you know, we, we are that stunted in our, in our class organization and development in this country. So the second international network of working class parties was founded on the 100th anniversary of the storm in the Bastille on July 14th, 1889. The most important early party of this formation, its lodestar was the German Social Democratic Party. In 1891, when the Erfurt program is drafted by Bernstein and Kotsky, uh, 
Marxism is is dominant within this 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 grouping as a as a whole. So some parties, like the French Socialists, for instance, uh, the FSIO in in France uh, had a more Republican flavor, uh, but but it's mostly this uh, this program that's 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 emulated. And their foot program is very dramatic. It portends a collapse of capitalism. It describes an era of devastating crisis, uh, each with um, ever more stark opposition growing between exploiters and exploited. You know, a common trend in this era of Marxism was the argument that class relations are simplifying over time, where middle stratas are getting absorbed uh, into this division between the proletarian and the uh, bourgeoisie, because they've obviously just seen all these uh, groups of artisans and petty proprietors become proletarianized in, in the preceding decades. So, uh, in in the document, Bernstein and Kotsky write that trans the transformation that they sought uh, amounted to an emancipation not only of the proletariat but of the entire human race. So this is the classically Marxist ascribing uh, of agency of the proletariat as a universal subject that would not just free itself through the creation of a worker state through the socialization of private production, but free all others. Um, and the program had a lot to say, not just about economic exploitation. It, it argued that, um, you know, the, the fight today was not only against the exploitation of wage earners, but against every matter of exploitation and oppression, whether directed against a class, party, sex, or race. Um, you know, we didn't need critical race theory and, and all these other kind of new academic um, uh, developments to to have a, a workers movement that fought against uh, oppression at least at least programmatically you know it was all uh, there in this uh this document and the immediate task of it which became the immediate task of all the social democratic parties was was laid out in a section largely drafted by bernstein you know without political rights it says the working class cannot carry on its economic struggles and develop its economic organization cannot bring about the transfer of the means of production into the possession of the community without having first obtained political uh, power. The immediate demands had, had things like the, the demand for proportional representation, the demand for universal suffrage, uh, political freedoms, uh, free medical care, uh, again, something we haven't won in the United States, uh, replacing standing armies with, with militias, kind of an old but very important Republican demand. It also advocated workplace reform, like the eight hour day and end to child labor and the prohibition of night work. So there was an obvious gap between the radical, almost apocalyptic vision of capitalism in crisis and the comparatively modest immediate demands put forth in the document. And there's also emerging within these parties tensions between the near and the far, between the immediate economic demands, for example, of growing industrial trade unions and that of the political movement of social democracy that they were technically supported to. Uh, and again, that's maybe something for, for another talk. I get into it in quite a bit of detail in one of the chapters of my book, uh, The Socialist Manifesto. And obviously, there's also a lot more in there about debates between Kotsky and Bernstein about revisionism or how uh, Kotsky, the radical, the Pope of Marxism, eventually broke with Lenin, Trotsky, Luxembourg, and other, other radicals. And also about what led to the Great War and the betrayal of internationalism that saw a lot of parties support implicitly or explicitly their national governments over the cause of socialist proletarian internationalism during World War I. But the short version is that over the next three decades, the unified workers movement split into multiple camps. First, it splits into the revolutionary socialist, you know, the communist, and the reformist camp. And then later in the 20s and 30s, that revolutionary socialist camp split into anti-Stalinist and Stalinist wings. And in the later in the 20th century, there's division between the social democratic camp between modernizers and traditional welfareists, social, democrat social democrats become obvious. Then of course, in recent times, in most places, it no longer really makes sense to talk about a unified socialist workers movement like you could a century ago because the Euphrodian kind of synthesis has been broken. There's still a weak and fragmented workers movement, but often one with no deep connection uh, with a largely 
you know, middle class uh, socialist uh, currents. But I want to switch to the actual purpose of my talk, which is the Swedish case study, the most important of the reformist attempts to give us doses of socialism and capitalism, briefly go into what it was and why it fell short and why I think it's worthy of so much attention uh, right now. So accounts of the rise of Sweden often focus on the country's exceptional features. So often people talk about Sweden's history as far as its civic culture, its high literacy rates and so on. Uh, they sometimes claim, which I think is completely wrong, uh, that there was limited state repression in Sweden. On both the right and certain pseudo-leftists in academia often invoke its racial homogeneity uh, as if you know, somehow Sweden being a, a white country helped it um, or being not diverse uh, helped it uh, um, uh, uh, create social democracy, uh, which isn't to say, of course, in the United States, uh, there wasn't a large role for racism and racial stratification explaining, at least in part, some of the weakness of our workers' movement. But on the whole, the countries left in Sweden face similar challenges to its counterparts elsewhere. It just managed to find ways to overcome it. So one relevant difference that's worth noting is that the country underwhelped industrialization relatively late in the 1870s. It was another decade later before the first trade unions were formed, meaning that the advocates of industrial unionism uh, that would go on to form BLO, the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, didn't have to contend with more powerful, more conservative uh, craft unions. And that was the big barrier in the United States, these conservative craft unions. But the late start, in other words, meant that Swedish unionism developed under the ideological influence of socialism. So the SAP was formed along with the creation of the Second International in 1889. And at the time, Sweden was really a very autocratic, very violent, very unequal country. So I cite in my book a 1902 New York Times article describing battles between workers and capitalists and the fear of some capitalist quote in the article of the red flag flying in Sweden. Uh, and the Times described Sweden as an environment as only rivaled by Russia as the most feudal and oligarchic country in Europe. It was also described at the time in workers' literature as an armed whorehouse. So uh, there's a reason why you know a lot of Americans, white Americans, have roots in Sweden because because the conditions were so bad. There was mass waves of of, of exodus and and immigration out of the country uh, during this period and the, the decades before. So in the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution, there there's there's a environment going on where some social democrats are obviously uh, um, joining communist splits, um, but most uh, uh, social democrats are are uh, not. So they're still Marxists. They still have a horizon of socialism. So for most of them, that meant a nationalized economy. That meant some sort of form of planning. Uh, they just thought that they could bring about the successor system within the more parliamentary framework of the capitalist republic. They didn't see the parliament, for instance, as a bourgeois creation. They, they saw it as a tool that could be uh, wielded. So it wasn't necessarily the ends that was in question, it was more um, the means. But they soon found out that actually it was pretty damn hard to figure out how to create an alternative political economy. So what they ended up doing uh, in the interwar period, socialists all across Europe, they at best found themselves in minority governments, more often than not just locked out of power or maybe in weak coalitions. And they formed commissions to study nationalization because that's what socialists do. Uh, we, we are very good at forming commissions and study groups, not actually good at implementing plans sometimes. But in this case, um, you know, they, they were grappling with, with how they could actually create some sort of viable alternative to capitalism. They were grappling with the fact that the barriers to going beyond capitalism aren't just political barriers, like the resistance of the capitalist class. The barriers are also uh, technical. It's like, how do you create an economy that works? What's the political form that goes along with this alternative uh, political economy? Because by then it was clear 
the Soviet Union was no no real model um, by its own admission. You know, it was just a, a, a semi-backward, largely rural country just hanging on by a thread in the 1920s, experimenting with his own reforms to the NAP and so on. So Kotsky, in one of these uh, studies, one of his writings from the period, I think this was from 1924, said, you know, the obvious, which is the creation of socialistic organizations is not so simple a process as we used to, to think. Um, so in the 1930s, the labor government under Ramsey McDonald, a truly despicable figure, uh, is probably the most extreme example of interwar futility. They basically refuse to do anything. They're just uh, in power saying, you know, we could neither reform capitalism nor go, go beyond it. And uh, we're really just going to stick to the, the most extreme forms of, of fiscal bourgeois orthodoxy. You know, a lot of the more creative thinking around the economy came from Keynes. It came from the liberal tradition, not from um, at least the, the main line of the, the Labour Party. In Sweden, socialists really aren't in power in any serious way until 1932. They had a brief spell in coalition government. Uh, with liberal forces before then, but in general, they're an extra parliamentary force in the first couple decades of the 20th century. They won suffrage, they're winning political democracy, and now it's time for them to actually win some social and economic um, democracy. But again, even when social democracy split in Sweden in 1917, it's really splitting over a disagreement over how to get to socialism. It was over means, not, not ends. Uh, whether they were going to adopt uh, the common turns um, um, program, like the Norwegian Labor Party, for instance, uh, actually applied for the Communist International, but was eventually rejected because they wouldn't adopt kind of the more stringent uh, requirements of a Communist Party set out by that that uh, document. But the Swedish Social De Democrats are backed up by mass rallies, by protests, by strikes. Uh, there's even a quasi-revolutionary moment in Sweden in 1917. But the 1930s government in Sweden is when social democratic history uh, in Sweden starts to get really important and when Sweden becomes the leading case study of social democracy in the whole world. Uh, because unlike the British labor government at the time, the Swedes are able to combine welfareist policies with effective crisis management. So it's a common mistake to call what they were doing the 30s Keynesian, even though it resembles it in some ways. In fact, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith had this line in one of his books saying that uh, what was said and done in Stockholm in the 1930s uh, predated Keynes. And he says, quote, in a terminologically exact world, the modern references would not be the Keynesian revolution, but the Swedish revolution. So in 1931, before they're in power, there is almost 20% unemployment in the country. By 1941, that unemployment rate is just 6.8%. You know, that's a bigger success story than the New Deal. It's a bigger success story than any contemporary example in that period of the left, center, or right. Uh, taxes were doubled. Important social programs were starting to stimulate employment. They developed the beginnings of an egalitarian housing policy that within a few decades uh, led to really ambitious housing policies. It saw one million homes being constructed in a country of just around, what, eight, nine million people. People were protected in old age. There were attempts to limit the working day and provide vacations, just like in France uh, with the Socialist Party's uh, in Socialist government in power, the Popular Front government in uh, 1936, Leon Bohm's government, you know, these vacation policies were the first time that working people actually had a uh, vacation, had time time off. It was really transformational in a, in a cultural sense. But in the 1930s, when you're talking about social democracy in Sweden, you're really just talking about progressive crisis management, plus the beginnings of egalitarian social reform. Uh, the rhetoric around what was being done in Sweden was actually quite corporatist as opposed to revolutionary. And there was lots of talk about creating a people's home under working class leadership that was resolve uh, power lies and class antagonism and so on. Uh, I don't have it with me, but I do know there's some very uh, favorable FDR quotes about what he thought was going on in, in Sweden and, and so on. But it is very much a program that's being led by the working class. 
So even the 1938 basic agreement, which created centralized bargaining between the LO Trade Union Confederation and the SAF, the Employers Federation, um, and also it, it inaugurated about a 30 year stretch of industrial peace by the SAF agreeing to this bargaining scheme and the LO uh, accepting management's right to manage, is one way to put it. Um, you know, these are all class compromises that are forced by the power of the workers' movement and its ability to harass employers until they got what they want. So it's a little bit different than just a class compromise that comes out of weakness. It's a little bit different when you're sitting down at a bargaining table but you've come with with guns. You know, it, it's 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 not quite uh, the type of corporatism that I think uh, people on the right, contemporaries who are allotting uh, Swedish social democracy in the nineteen thirties, uh, uh, saw because uh, they often compared it to the corporatism of the New Deal and so on. I think this was something that even at the time was more militant. But after the forties, there's more and more debates about the planned economy about nationalization and a greater role for the state. Now, this is in a context when elites are discredited across Europe and the workers' movement is emboldened. And also, Sweden obviously stayed out of the, the war, um, uh, collaborated a bit in terms of its arms production uh, uh, with, with the rival uh, powers, but doesn't have the same rebuilding to do that, that these other countries uh, do. But this is the wider environment. And there's the idea, there's a radicalization within the SAP, the Swedish Social Democratic uh, Party, that the labor movement, quote, should from now on devote more interest to the problems of production, with only distributive reforms will not go so far. So those are words that would ring very true throughout the whole length of the Swedish Social Democratic experience. At the very least, the SAP, Swedish Social Democratic Party, didn't just want to redistribute. They wanted to shape industrial policy. In the early 1950s, an actual means to do this, short of total nationalization, is, is found. Now, at this time, by the way, it's worth noting the Social Democrats are winning election after election. They're in power basically continuously from the 1930s until the 1970s. Sometimes they're an outright majority, but often they're in coalition with the country's agrarian party um, and um, sometimes in coalition with the country's communist party. Um, on the agrarian party, by the way, the progressive kind of basis of Swedish agriculture and its former class is another particularity of the country that's worth looking into, along with uh, late industrialization that I, that I mentioned before, if you're curious about what might have made Sweden different. Um, but for the, for the sake of my emphasis, I think it's more important to think about how Sweden encountered actually a, a condition that was quite similar to the workers' movement uh, elsewhere. They were just able to, through political organizing, overcome a lot of, a lot of the barriers better than their counterparts elsewhere. So in 1951, the ren minor plan was created by two LO uh, economists, um, uh, Ren and Meidner, <laughs> they were tasked with creating a model that could sustain growth as well as full employment, um, and also that maintained a relatively equal income distribution, all at the same time as keeping inflation low. So it's a, it's a tall order, you know, in, in typical uh, macroeconomic policy at the time, you would think that a lot of those things would be in, in really strong uh, tension. So they knew they had to shape industrial policy and influence economic expansion, but regular capitalist development was not going to do all those things. Even if you were just going to let capitalism develop and then just like tax the shit out of it once it developed, you know, wasn't going to uh, check all those boxes. You know, at the very least, it was going to get the growth part right, but none of, none of the rest. So they advocated a mechanism for doing this through that centralized a labor bargaining mechanism rather than direct state intervention. So it was governed first and foremost by the principle of equal pay for equal work. Uh, that meant that differentiated wages should be determined by the type of work performed, not by a particular employer's ability to pay or a worker's uh, power on their shop floor. Uh, so this was done for three reasons. One, 
It was an ideological commitment to equality. Uh, even if wages can't be equal, at the very least, we should lift up the incomes of the worst off and also you know, limit the, the um, um, advantages of, of, of the best. Um, and, and Meidner especially, you know, this is, this is a man who is uh, a, a socialist and a, and a Marxist in the best sense of the, 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 the word. He was not a tepid social democrat. And second, because wage compression was politically useful. It reduced divisions between the working class, promoted solidarity across industries. And three, because it created, it played a very important macroeconomic role in the, in the plan. So I'll give you a very rough example of the plan working, because I know this is probably a little bit confusing and abstract, but let's think about the US auto sector. Obviously all these numbers are, are make believe, but let's say you have a US auto sector that has three uh, major companies. You have Ford, you have GM, and you have Chrysler. Let's pretend that Ford is the best performing firm out of those three. GM is in the middle and Chrysler is the least productive. It's barely hanging on. So the wage demands in this, in this system would be set at the level so that the average firm in this sector, General Motors, could survive. But less efficient firms like Chrysler would be squeezed and forced to radically restructure or go bankrupt. On the other extreme, the most productive firm, forward in this example, would benefit from the wage restraints of their workers and garner excess profits. These profits would then be allow them to expand their productive capacity and thus generate more wealth and employment. So the system helped encourage high wage uh, uh, employment and also helped encourage, encourage capital intensive um, industries. So what happens to, to Chrysler? Let's say they do go under, uh, then active labor market policies and state-funded job retraining uh, could help workers move from Chrysler, uh, from this, this failed firm, to a more efficient and expanding firm like uh, General Motors or to another sector entirely. Um, or they could get absorbed into an expanding state sector uh, because the state sector in Sweden was beginning to provide uh, a cradle to grave uh, welfare state, especially by the 60s and 70s, this was developed. And this large state sector absorbed uh, unemployment. It kept the uh, unemployment rate very low. So leading Swedish social democrats at the time called it functional socialism in that it made certain socialist priorities clear, but it would seek them out by shaping the outcomes of capitalist enterprise rather than through nationalization. So. Such a model was one that capitalists might benefit from in some sense. Like if you're a Swedish capitalist in 1958, you at least don't have to worry about the crazy amount of strikes that you had to worry about in the UK or in France or in some other countries in Italy. Um, but you also had to give up a lot of power and a lot of uh, wealth to the, to the state. But maybe you could say there's some, there's some stability you're getting there. But as Meidner put it, management prefers decentralized bargaining. And they also prefer having wage differentials as instruments of managerial control. So the main prerogatives of the system in Sweden in the post-war period, they were set by labor and they were set by uh, this workers' party, the, the Swedish Social Democratic um, Party. So even though capitalists benefited from the Red Minder plan in many respects, it was only implemented because of powerful labor movement and social democratic party forced its way. Nevertheless, it's worth noting that it was a socialism of sorts jointly administered by a powerful employers federation. Uh, and that federation was able to set red lines about how far private ownership rights could be eroded. And as late as the 1970s, only about 5% of Swedish industry was under public ownership. A communist parliamentarian in Sweden you know, would, would constantly harp on the floor of the, the Swedish parliament that despite years, decades even, of uninterrupted social democratic rule, 15 families own the majority of Swedish industry. So the share of wealth under public ownership was far higher than before. It was dramatically rising. That was a goal the SAP went for. But the classically Marxist questions of ownership and control, these went largely unaddressed. So even though 
um, their models were less successful in terms of human outcome scope or electoral performance. This emphasis, the emphasis on ownership was seen across social democratic parties in the 50s and 60s. So in the UK, if you wanna see a book that's a, a great encapsulation of this revisionism, you could read Anthony Crosland's A Future for Socialism. Um, that was the UK Labour Party's version. And around then, 1959, the German SPD fully broke from, from Marxism and removed all mention, basically, of class struggle from their program. So they were codifying what, what was their, their practice already. So in Sweden, though, you know, there's more wealth in the hands of workers. A workers' party was in political control. But in the last instance, the capitalist class still had control of the means of production. And this naturally led to a, a contradiction. So there's a lot that can be said about Sweden in the 1960s when things start to get interesting in the country, especially starting at the end of the decade with Ola Palma's uh, uh, tenure in power as prime minister, you know, his internationalism, his solidarity with the third world, his emphasis on women's liberation really just set him apart. He also, by the way, had a really, really interesting life. He was politicized in part uh, from seeing racism and inequality in the United States when he was a student here, a young man in the 1940s. And by, by seeing the UAW and the US Union movement in action, uh, he, he kind of became a social democrat uh, on the basis of American social democracy, our weak and anemic uh, American left, which is a, a really, really bizarre turn of events. Um, but I wanna focus on the bigger picture of the model because that's, that's where the key lessons are. Um, so I think this is really one place where I have to launch a slight criticism of a friend of Jacobin and comrade Naomi Klein and, and others who offer a popular version of the rise of neoliberalism as a counteroffensive that just comes unidirectional uh, from capital. So this is a bastardized version of the account. They're far more sophisticated than this, but basically we're happy-go-lucky in the post-war compromise, we're getting shared prosperity, we're in our Fordist workplaces or whatever. Uh, then, you know, Milton Friedman and the Chicago School and greedy capitalists uh, rebel and they, they break the model. And also along with the story is the idea we could just go back to that, that old model. Actually, in Sweden, what's interesting is that I would argue that it's the workers who rebel against the class compromise first. They rebel against the compromise represented by the 1938 basic agreement I mentioned earlier, which explicitly had workers respect management's right to manage, while management had to abide by the decisions of centralized bargaining and yield a lot of its share of national wealth to workers. So uh, starting around 1967, there's a long wave of industrial discontent that exists in some form for around a decade. You know, workers are starting to demand not just better wages, not just better conditions, but they're starting to demand more industrial democracy too. You know, decades under a strong welfare state didn't actually make workers dull or dumb or content or happy or, or any of these other predictions that both capitalists and, and even quite frankly, some, some um, radicals, some, some revolutionary socialists might have, might have guessed, but it fostered more expansive demands. So previously, so Swedish social democracy had engaged in very little industrial planning. Uh, they relied on, on unions. Uh, they relied on very, very targeted interventions to shape market forces with the state playing a hands-off role. But now by the 1960s, late 1960s, you're seeing more demands on the shop floor for industrial democracy. You're also seeing the government set up uh, new public investment banks and expand state enterprises. And, and create other mechanisms to coordinate these things. And, and you know, these changes weren't necessarily anti-capitalist. Um, there's, there's a role for, for planning in developmental states and Gaulism and all these other quite capitalist models of, of, of um, capitalism. Uh, but even though capitalists could accept some active industrial policy, the push to expand workplace democracy was bitterly resisted. So at low trade union uh, leaders, had to, on their own hand, contend with a wave of wildcat strikes. Uh, they were being pushed left. The Federation began advocating the extension of collective bargaining to non-economic concerns. Um, the employers organized in the SAF, of course, refused any of these things because it, it was a violation of this 1938 
basic agreement. And as a result, the LO starts pushing its demands, not just through centralized bargaining where there's, there's increasing impasses, but through social democratic legislation. So with the backing of Palma's Social Democratic Party, employers were able to negotiate with, with unions on just about every workplace issue. So the, the terms of the basic agreement were violated. It was labor, not capital, in my mind, that, that fired the first uh, shot. So the most radical shift was the minor plan in 1976, 1975, 1976 is put forward. Peter Gowan actually gave a long talk for us just on that. I think he, we talked for about an hour just on this, this one little uh, chapter, so there's no need for me to really get into it. I, I really want to wrap up in the next three minutes. But the basic is the MIGRA plan was meant to practically solve a, a, uh, a problem and also was created for ideological um, reasons. It was a proposal for a collectively owned wage earner fund that would slowly over time um, a pool together uh, worker funds and, and slowly take over ownership of most large firms in Sweden over the course of, of, of several uh, decades. So the MIGRA plan ha had two different uh, goals. The first was a practical resolution to a problem of Swedish social democracy. So I mentioned before the system of, of um, solidaristic uh, wage bargaining. And I mentioned before that in my example, I think Ford was the most productive firm. So um, the wage restraints of those Ford workers allowed for expansion, which helped fuel the growth of the Swede, Swedish economy. Because if they were just bargaining by themselves, they could demand more money than what they got by uh, putting their demands at GM levels of productivity. It also helped curb inflationary pressures. It had, had, a, had a very important macroeconomic uh, role. But those policies led to these excess profits sometimes not being productively invested. So many workers, especially those with valuable skills, felt that, wage in, that they deserved wage increases and they felt they were granted less than they deserved. And this had the potential to undermine the solidarity they kept that form of wage bargaining together. So there's this practical alternative to solve this problem because one, it's, it's, there's the slowdown in productivity and, and growth. And this is a tremendous period of change in capitalism. Things are starting to go, globalize even quicker. There's the OPEC oil shock. Uh, there's all these things going on and capital in general just didn't want to invest. Uh, they were gonna wait a while for a better investment climate. Um, so this was labor's attempt to take back some of the wealth they were creating and put it to use and to keep the existing red minor, uh, red minor model going in a, in a more radical form. So it was either you got to take one step forward towards a more radical socialism or you're going to end up taking two steps backward. And Meidre said it himself in 1975 interview when he was introducing the plan. He said that, quote, we cannot fundamentally change society without changing its ownership structure. Now that sounds like a fucking Jacobin thing to say. You know, it's a left-wing repudiation of, of functional socialism. So long story short, it's both this ideological push. There's, they sang the Internationale when it was passed. They really wanted a more radical form of socialism. They wanted more worker power for ideological reasons. But it also was meant to fix the social democratic model that's starting to fail for all host of, of reasons. In the end, the plan wasn't enacted. There's tremendous resistance by the Employers Federation. There's mass protests. At the time, the largest mass protests in Swedish history uh, were, were launched against this, this plan. Um, the SAP, in the end, waters it down. Uh, Palma loses the, the election in, in 1976. Um, not really over, over this issue, but, but it was a factor. Um, but in other words, this left-wing path of social democracy was not pursued. And the old center way of social democracy was no longer viable um, in the 1970s. And I think we, we saw that proved by the failures of, of, the, uh, so of social democracy in, in France and, and Greece in the 1980s. So what we got was the right wing path. And the right wing path was saying, all right, we need to figure out a way to restore profitability. We need to figure out a way to keep the economy growing so that we would have something to tax so we can maintain the key parts of our welfare state. 
And that means controlling the power of unions. That means certain forms of deregulation. That means accepting a tactical retreat. And that is a, probably the best, best faith way to describe Schroederism and Blairism and Brownism and all these other kind of uh, attempts at third way social democracy. Uh, it's a little bit, it's rationalizing them a little bit uh, much because some of them are just real bastards and yeah, deserve no such justification. But that was their, their thinking. That was the right wing of social, social democracy. And in the end, obviously what these people did was they undermined their own social base. You know, why would you as a worker vote for a party that's promising you neoliberalism by a thousand little micro um, uh, cuts? Uh, well, why would you be motivated to turn out and vote at all? Um, and, and, and this really set into motion a chain of events in Europe now that's paving the way for the rise of the populist right. Um, as social democratic parties abandoned workers, as they oriented themselves to the middle class, as they made themselves more parties of liberal reform, um, in the American sense, liberal reform, and, and less and less parties of the organized uh, working class and social democracy, they lost a lot of their, their mass um, base. Um, and it's our gambit that there was a different route out of the impasse of social democracy, and that, that route was through more socialization, more class struggle, more workers' power, not not less. So I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, today, I think often when people talk about social democracy, at least in the forms of Sanders and Corbyn and these other new manifestations on the left, uh, we should differentiate it from what social democracy was in the past, and especially what this right wing variant of social democracy uh, became. Uh, that's why I like the term class struggle social democracy. In my mind, class struggle social democracy doesn't close avenues for radicals, it opens them up. So on the face of it, Corbyn's and, and Sanders in their, their last election campaigns were advocating a set of demands that were essentially social democratic. So they represent something far different than modern social democracy. So when people say to you, oh, you know, Bernie in Germany would just be Angela Merkel. No, that's bullshit. Bernie would be on the left wing of the Linka if, if he was in Germany, in my mind, in terms of uh, how confrontational his rhetoric is, at least, uh, if not in his, his program. So whereas social democracy, as I described it, morphed in the post-war period into a tool to suppress class conflict often in favor of these tripartite agreement between business and labor and the state, these leaders, Corbyn and Sanders, were encouraging a renewal of class antagonism and movements from below. You know, Sanders' path was all about reform through confrontation with elites. He didn't talk about an entire nation struggling to restore the U.S. economy and shared prosperity, uh, to negotiate sentiment, you know, better sentiment with, with business leaders. You know, he was talking about creating a political revolution to get what we deserve for millionaires and billionaires. That's a program that creates polarization along class uh, lines. You know, you know this, is, this is someone who didn't represent a social democratic politics that served as a moderate alternative to militant socialist demands, but a, but a radical alternative to decrepit center left. And when it comes to internationalism, social democratic parties across the world, you know, Sweden was kind of an exception, but a lot of these countries worked hand in hand with NATO and US imperialism. Whereas Sanders and Corbyn were bucking a lot of the trends of, of, of contemporary uh, US foreign policy of the interests of, of empire. You could hear it when Sanders talks about Palestine, especially you could hear it Corbyn, who really comes from this militant anti-imperialist tradition. And this is why the British media hated him, because they knew that he stood in solidarity with those fighting for United Ireland, and he stood in solidarity for those fighting for, um, for Palestinian uh, liberation and, and, and against the war in Iraq and so on and so on. So in the end, I'll wrap up by just saying class struggle social democracy it, it is about, I think, generating working class strength through electoral campaigns. It's not about subordinating existing struggles just to get a few people uh, elected. Uh, it, it has been a really positive development on, on the left. And in general, when we think about the history of social democracy, we should think about social democracy in its most classic model, even in Sweden, as being made possible by intense levels of class organization, 
both at the level of having a mass working class party in the SAP um, uh, and also having a highly organized, highly centralized trade union uh, confederation in the LO and, and later its white collar um, uh, counterparts. And we should think about it as not being a completely separate road to that of a more radical socialism. As far as I'm concerned, plans like the Monitor Plan, the rank and file militancy of the late 60s and early 70s, these all came as close as we've gotten in the Western world, in the advanced capitalist world, to subordinating the interests of capital to the interests of workers. So if you are interested at all in socialism, if you want a world after capitalism, we shouldn't just draw lessons from 1917 in Russia. We really also have to draw lessons from you know, 1971 in Sweden as well. And I've gone over more than intended, about 15 minutes. So I'll just wrap it up uh, there and I'll leave, leave it to, to your questions and to Asher's questions. I'm in a room without an AC, so I'm sweating. So I might get up and get a glass of water, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have, Asher. Well, that was pretty impressive. You went through 140 years of history and I don't know, 30 minutes. Oh, I, I, I did like 40, yeah, I went way over. Up, so. It's still impressive. I, I, you did okay. So I think, I mean, you know, you went, you, you, you gave us the arc. Um, there's, a, you know, I think on a more abstract level, you told a story, certainly in the post-war part of your discussion, of a sort of a shift from more active and, and conflictual modes of confrontation to the building of institutions, collaboration, you said tripartite negotiations between the state, capitalists, and labor. And these were things that labor movements and labor parties chose to do because it allowed them to actually win and defend gains and to provide stability. And this was, you know, their, their, the transformation of their societies were predicated on one level or another on a sort of social peace or at least the possibility of one, even if that threat was always there. And this resulted in, obviously, in the long run, certain cases in demobilization and others, um, remobilization and defeat. Um, we now live in a world that, and I'm just focusing not on the macroeconomic and sort of major institutional difference, but the political, political differences, we now live in a world that uh, is characterized by an incredible absence of organized working class power. So I'm curious when you think of when you know when you you give this arc of social democracy and it ends with this sort of a, 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 this this resurgent form, which is a class struggle social democracy, making many of the same demands, but with a reorientation towards conflict. Where, from, from yeah, where I, mean, I, I think that's power. a great question. You're getting at a, a major contradiction I wasn't even able to address, which is that, you know, fundamentally, a party like the Social Democratic Party in Sweden has to maintain a parliamentary majority, right? So they have to maintain a, a parliamentary majority, and the majority of the population, at least, was not the old, organized um, uh, working class within the... Um, SAP, you know, so they had to maintain the support of the, the middle class. They had to engage in all sorts of horse trading and other things there. Same thing with trade unions, right? Trade unions are inherently, uh, obviously progressive in the sense that they're fighting against the interests of the boss, but they're reliant on having profitable capitalist firms in order to survive. You know, they're reliant on, um, making sure their wage demands are, are in check. Um, a, a trade union that refuses to make compromises uh, with, with capitalist interests is, is not serving the interests of their, their members, at least in the short and medium term, very well. The same way, same is true of a social democratic party. You know, you're, when you're administrating uh, the bourgeois state, you're relying on uh, profits um, from uh, profitable corporations that you could uh, tax 
and redistribute. And I think this is where we need to add a new layer to our criticism of social democracy, the political layer. We should question whether the existing vehicles like the SAP were potential vehicles of a more radical uh, socialism. So we should be thinking about what kind of party formation do we need? Um, is it all just completely voluntaristic? Like in other words, if the SAP had an organized left wing that was able to win control of the, the party, and that was combined with this rank and file activity that was going on in the LO, then you know maybe you you have the chance for for um, something else. But but this is the subjective, the political dimension that's that's really important. So we should both study the left wing of social democracy, study the the minor plan, study Sweden, and also read Rosa Luxemburg. And I, I don't really see a, a contradiction there. You know what I mean? Does that, does that answer your question, or am I kind of missing some some people? No, I, I I think you did answer the question. I mean, I think the the context of my question was sort of focused on uh, a less distant horizon, uh, perhaps a less meaningful uh, transformation and more sort of, I was thinking about, you know, uh, the, the sort of political bases, the political, whether, whether the political requirements for even just a simple reversal of the retrenchment of the last 30 years, um, we're, we're, we're here. I mean, wh wh whether, whether, whether we have this sort of uh, the institutional power, the class power to, 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 to even win like, like the simple social democratic demands of a Corbyn or a Bernie. And I think, and I was actually actively sort of putting on the side the, the meaningful macroeconomic uh, geopolitical differences between today and what considered. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you could build social democracy in the same way. And also, I think we have to be open to maybe uh, popular shortcuts, especially in a country like the United States. So in other words, I really do believe that one of our primary tasks, in addition to the slow work of building civil society and so on, needs to be getting state power as soon as possible. That's, I mean, with Bernie Sanders gone, it's, it's, it's a very fleeting, fleeting thing, but when I gave you the arc, the very long arc, I'm sorry I went so long, on uh, social democracy, it started with the emergence of an industrial proletariat and working class parties and trade unions, and then the quest for state power. It took decades and it went along with the formation of a, of a class and developments in, in capitalism. So what happens when we're trying to build the workers movement that we want here, but we're at a point already of, of class, um, uh, kind of disintegration, when there's less and less civil society, period, right? Much less uh, working class organization, when even the most basic forms of trade unionism and class struggle are are gone, when we're living in a country that, that isn't super uh, politicized, where there's not that much uh, class uh, consciousness. Um, and I, I think in this case, there's a really strong argument to be made that by pursuing something like our, our electoral path, what we're trying to do is enact some sort of shortcut where we from above start jumpstarting uh, things and, and creating the conditions where it's easier to organize from, uh, from below. And that's what I was really interested in with, with Sanders and with, with Corbyn whether or not these figures can help reverse a, a, a process of very slow um, uh, de decline. And obviously we need to combine those attempts to seek shortcuts with our slow and steady work of, of, of class um, organization, of building an independent profile for socialism and rebuilding the trade union movement. And also even just winning some basic things like Medicare for all that tell people that politics can in fact make their lives better. Because uh, right now, I mean, it's beautiful that all these Americans have been on the street protesting in the past couple of years for, for causes from racial justice to supporting Bernie Sanders to, to um, you know, uh, uh, fighting against uh, oppression of all types. Um, because actually, we haven't got a lot of wins. Uh, there, there's been no really active and clear proof that um, this stuff matters. That's why I think winning some, some immediate demands uh, might um, might help.
Um, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, should we get to some of these questions in the chat? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're more? So I think I'll just start, I guess, where they're most related to what we're already talking about. There were a few questions around um, how to deal with things like runs on your currency, capital flight, and the like um, when you're fighting for reforms. And then I think not altogether unrelated to that, there were several questions on uh, the transformative potential of a Green New Deal. Um, I think those actually, both those were dovetail pretty well. Mm -hmm. Things you already talked about in your-, your Yeah, well, history. I think one, one useful thing when you think about the Green New Deal to this like class struggle, social democratic frame, I actually think one thing works really well, which is that certain sectors of capitalists really benefited more than others from the Swedish social democratic model. But the Swedish social democratic model wasn't created by getting together a bunch of capitalists in more capital intensive industries or whatever else might benefit more from this, this model and saying, hey, you're on the team with the workers movement now to, to push these reforms. You know, will you join us? Um, it was kind of an unintended side effect that certain sectors of capital were better able to cope with the new demands and the new system. And some even thrived in that environment. And I draw that connection with the Green New Deal because you can't have an environmental movement, you can't have a green movement that, that gets down and sit, sits down with, with green capitalists and sits down with, with certain sectors of capital and says, you know, you're in this together with us and we're gonna work together to make the world a better, better place. You really can, in fact, push these demands with class independence, uh, with the idea that we're going to pursue uh, policies of carrots and sticks and create some sort of industrial policy in the, this country that has an environmental uh, component, <coughs> aim of both creating jobs and uh, reducing emissions. And yeah, certain capitals are going to make a shitload of money off of it because uh, unfortunately we're still stuck within this capitalist political economy. That's uh, different than from the very beginning getting Elon Musk or any of these other guys at the at the table um, with you. And I think that's a distinction maybe that I would draw between the immediate uh, social democratic demands of a socialist movement versus modern contemporary social uh, democracy. If that distinction, does that distinction make sense to you, Asher? That makes a lot of sense to me. It, it sort of makes you want to circle back though to the sort of the Bernie is get out of jail free card and the potential populist route um, to get us out of our sort of weak institutional power problem. And so right now we're in, in this moment where we're, we're out of power, we're far from power. The conditions for our power seem relatively far away. High unemployment, low growth, you know, super mobile capital, um, weak labor institutions. And people on the chat are talking about is MMT perhaps a way out of this? Is, you know, if we, if we could influence government and if it is in fact the case that there are in the last instance no fiscal limitations on what we can do, isn't it possible that without serious conflict we could right. raise the, 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 the standard of living and the, the growth right. of the many while still keeping the capitalists relatively happy? Well, my view on MMT is that it's a reminder that we are far away from fiscal limits, especially in a country like the United States, very, very far away in the United States. Um, I do think there are um, still uh, limits though. You know, I, I do think um, that fundamentally, uh, we are still uh, dependent on maintaining a level of uh, profitability and, and, and productivity that, that's gonna come from um, a taxing private firms in the, in the short term. And obviously our goal is to push a path of development in which we are uh, socializing those firms and we're, we're replacing private capitalist ownership with forms of collective ownership, be they worker cooperatives, be they targeted nationalizations or, or whatnot. You know, that's, that's a topic for another discussion. Actually, for, for those of you in the chat who, who know him, uh, me and Mike Beggs and Ben Burgess are actually working on a book together on market 
um, market socialism. So we're going to be getting into some of these <laughs> debates around market socialism and, and what we think that the alternative um, is. Asher, I know you're an advocate of, of uh, a democratic uh, planning, so you'll be the first reader on the book. But uh, I do think there was a question that, that popped up that I, I think is useful, which is, and I'd actually like to pose it to you, which is, what does class struggle social democracy look like post Bernie? Should we be looking for a similar political figure or focus elsewhere? One is, if there was one, I would say yes, because this last five years we made up some ground, and but there's not another Bernie Sanders. So I, I kind of feel like this is where we maybe need to focus on on our regional strategy um, around building up kind of a, a red base. Uh, Dustin Guastella, Jared Abbott, and Jacobin suggested the Southwest in a recent article. Uh, which actually gives a really um, interesting uh, development. Uh, so yeah, so maybe we could we could maybe pursue uh, uh, building our, our our strength in certain regions of the U.S. Um, that we think are are ripe for social democracy. I don't mean it in like a narrow localist way. I just mean in terms of uh, making sure that our our organizational resources on the left are are devoted to pursuing the right uh, right races and the right right areas. But but. What would you say to something like that? Because we are trying to translate the language and the strategies and the lessons of mass workers' parties, be they revolutionary or reformist, in a context where we don't have one. Yeah, I mean, it's we we put it, we put a lot of our uh, a lot of our eggs into one basket, and I think we did so for good reason. It was a it was not necessarily a gamble of choice as much as it was a gamble of necessity. Um, but now we're sort of, you know, we're left in a position where um, we have to focus on building and maintaining the institutions we have, whether that be the DSA, um, a labor movement that looks like it's certainly more capable than it has been in the last 30 years of regaining some of its militancy. but. I, I don't see a path forward that doesn't include uh, continued commitment to various forms of electoralism, if only because I see no other route to access the millions upon millions of suffering people in this country that who, whose lives we don't touch, whose neighborhoods many, you know, many people who, who think of themselves as committed socialists don't come from, and without um, continuing our commitment to various kinds of electoralism, obviously in tandem with more classical forms of workplace struggle, neighborhood struggles. Um, I, it, it, I don't, I don't, I frankly don't see a way forward. But I think that, you know, saying saying that it's we we should be very aware of this, the the objective constraints against which. Um, we'll be struggling, and I, you know, and I, this is this is a you know, just as much as it was a few months ago. This is certainly a moment for uh, reflection. Right. Well, well, one thing that is is useful, I think, to remember in this period is that you could say uh, to give a shitty uh, football analogy that Swedish social democracy, you know, got the ball to the red zone and then just like fucked it up or settled for a field goal, field goal or something. Um, but in our case, we just like haven't even been on the field. You know, in the United States, even falling way short of the goal of democratic socialism, but getting a little bit more dignity, a little bit more respect for people would, would change profoundly millions of lives and, and also would create space in the rest of the world too, because uh, the US is the number one enemy uh, historically of progressive revolutionary movements all around the world. And I know you you were in Venezuela for some period, so you saw it uh, firsthand. Um, you know, we're still getting more details about what happened in 2002, especially with the destabilization um, in, in Venezuela. And I think that had a lot of consequences later on for the trajectory of that revolution and for the development of the, the PSUV. Um, but, um, but anyway, there is one question that, that I think is interesting and it's more up your alley than, than my alley, which is that, you know, what are the mechanisms we have to combat capital flight or probably the, the bigger threat, uh, capital refusing to invest under social democracy. So one thing that's been brought up when we've had this conversations in the past on this channel with Mike McCarthy and others 
is that the US uh, uh, monetary role in the world actually gives us a tremendous advantage, along with the fact that we're, we're talking about administrating not socialism in one country, but socialism in a fucking, you know, a, a continent, right? And obviously we could criticize the, the you know, how the US came to become a, a continent to, to begin with, but uh, but what, what would you say to that? Would you say something along those lines, like the, the, the power of the US uh, uh, currency and its position in the world economy, giving us a lot of um, leverage that other countries wouldn't have to pursue this kind of program? I mean, I think, I think the leverage goes before beyond that, because, be, you know, obviously we have the universal currency that gives us incredible leverage with respect to our monetary policy. We've seen that in action basically on a nonstop basis since 2008 with the various rounds of quantitative easing, just basically helicopter money, right? Um, but I think beyond that, there's a, the, the U.S. is also unique in just the sheer size diver and diversity of its economy and the extent to which it's driven by internal fact by internal factors you know first among them you know consumer demand but we are not as de as dependent on trade as let's say a sweden was so it actually leaves the united states much less open to runs on our sovereign bonds or what have you and it, and it is fundamentally different. but that that said we exist in a really different world than you know, when, we, when we're talking about financial infrastructure, then the world of the golden age of social democracy. I mean, we have to remember that when, you know, when, when France was, you know, was basically trying to have a, a half-planned economy, albeit without threatening the, the right to manage by its bosses, while Sweden was developing the most robust and egalitarian welfare state the world has ever seen, and the list goes on, this was happening in the context of fixed exchange rates, Bretton Woods, and, a, and a, an international financial and monetary system that was created in order to allow states to operate autonomous fiscal policy, and that's largely gone. So I, when, while it's true that our currency would be more robust and our economy um, operates slightly more independently than other economies, it's also the case that every single financial asset in the United States is subject to fluctuations and movements on a global on a, on a, on a global scale, and, and and any meaningful changes jet will you know are going to generate unintended consequences that any socialist government would have to deal with, and it's tricky. I mean, it it's probably trickier now than it used to be, and I can't I can't imagine. Um, I mean, I can imagine a world where we can provide more universal goods um, and, incre and, and, and increase the welfare and well-being of millions of American citizens without it generating some kind of crisis of capital fright, flight or something of the like. But when it comes to the, the sorts of reforms that you are advocating for, like that, that actually challenge the right to manage of owners, so the, like you know their 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 ownership prerogatives, I can't see. That not generate, you know, that we, you know, right. Well, I, I, I think this is why we need to think about skipping steps. In other words, uh -huh. we can't wait a few decades until we can start asking the ownership and distributional questions. I think we need to foreground them much sooner. Uh -huh. So we need to kind of flip the script and integrate the demands that, that ask about power and control into the basics of the social democratic. Um, arrangement. So we need to say right off the bat, as part of our minimum program, you know, when when a socialist government somewhere gets into power, it's not just uh, we're going to tax a bit more, we're going to regulate a bit more, we're going to start this or that social program. It's also we are going to start a wage earner fund. We're taking ten percent of the the um, economy. You know, whatever. I, I I am just using that as a as a example. We shouldn't consider it kind of this untouchable thing. We need to start making inroads there there first. But also, as far as the, the situation looking bleak, I would, I would think that on the left, we actually need to be a bit more uh, voluntaristic. I don't want people to think I've become a Maoist overnight because I'm talking about like red bases in the Southwest and, 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 um, and, and you know, becoming super voluntaristic. But, um, you know, the movement that will get to the point that'll be threatening enough that it'll spur capital flight or an investment strike will be a movement 
that have, would have won significant gains already and would have elected a socialist and would have created an infrastructure, a party infrastructure at the neighborhood level, at the precinct and block level, at everything. So it would have been a movement that already have had victories and degrees of, of class consciousness and struggle and organization. And I think this movement would have been, we would have to assume would be able to be prepared for the capitalist counteroffensive and also be prepared to take some short-term sacrifices in the interest of long-term durable uh, transformation and working class um, power. Um, and, and that's where I think, that's where the power of politics comes in. That's where the power of political leadership comes in. That's where the power of parties and red unions and the rest come in. You know, I know you have some experience with seeing these transformations happen and in Latin America and, and elsewhere, but, you know, consciousness does transform within, within these struggles and, and organizations are transformed from being somewhat weak and, and tentative to being really uh, militant tools of, of, of class, class power. And I, I think we can't have a static vision of we're going to have to enact these things with the movement we have today. Uh, but we have to imagine this will be a, a transformational process. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one thing I think we get from, uh, I think we're like Luxembourg, as opposed for Tarkovsky and others, is that instead of seeing it as a straight line of reforms and increasing agency and consciousness and whatnot, um, there are sudden leaps. It's, it's not an even process. So we need a strategy of patience that prepares for the low, slow, steady process but we also need to be at a subjective level ready for the massive leaps where like whatever that fucking Lenin quote is, right? Like um, days, days and hours, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, I think you got at one of these like just incredible and difficult contradictions, um, sort of not like Marxian dialectical contradictions, but like human moral contradictions about being a socialist is that I think, you know, people are socialists because in the last instance, we're committed to a more egalitarian world. We don't want people to suffer. And we tend to believe that the way to do that is to build a different kind of world to transform our institutions. And we tend to think in action that the way you do that is through struggle. But there's this issue where we, we also know that any meaningful sort of transformative change is at the very, at the bare minimum, going to result in incredible risk and instability, and in all likelihood, some kind of trough, difficulty, and you know, and and, and so when when we think about the question, you you've talked, just keep on referencing the party and organization, and it seems like in order to get to to get past a trough, to get past these difficult periods, whether they be capital strikes, capital flight, capitalist counteroffensive resistance to this or that reform, how, you know, you, you need an organization to sort of, to maintain cohesion, to carry through. I don't think it's just a right. you know, building a new kind of morality, uh, a new kind of human being. It's certainly, I'm not accusing you of being mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but, but when in the process of struggle, like there, there is that transformation too, but yeah, you need that, that organization. It doesn't happen spontaneously, but the act of creating the shell, the organization, can be the act of a relative minority. The act of mass struggle within that shell cannot be the act of a majority, uh, a minority, if it's going to yield really durable uh, change. But if you look at the early formation of these parties, it's very random. It's not. It's often just small, little, isolated groups or small groups of artisans or or, or um, small groups of, in the case of the, the UK, like a very middle-class uh, political movement give, giving birth to a labor party. It was part and parcel with the process of class formation. And since we, we've seen a disintegration of, of our working class, you know, I, you know perhaps it's, it's part of the project to rebuild. Re reformation, right. And I, I think that is an interesting question. Actually, that's a, a topic for, for a future uh, Jacobin issue, a kind of class formation or reformation issue. I've been I've been uh, brainstorming. I also want one on on a failed state. I think our next issue, after this coming issue, this out in a couple of weeks on um, kind of after 
after Bernie issue, um, mm -hmm. which we're just obliged to do after multiple Bernie Bernie issues. <laughs> um, He's already yeah. passed the issue. Well, 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 one on the idea of the U.S. as a as a failed state, essentially, compared to any other industrial uh, a country. What explains mm -hmm. our uh, just incredible weakness in terms of creating uh, proper social policy, responding to coronavirus, preparing for climate change, which which portends just the most awful destruction or regression at the very least of, of human civilization. Um, and uh, my personal inclination is just to rooted uh, the reductionist that I am in our lack of a labor party, our lack of a, a civilizing, politicized uh, uh, workers movement that could, that could shape capitalist um, uh, development and force the types of, of social policies can make change. And, and you know, the toughest questions we're getting in this chat are questions that are like, you know, isn't this just deck chair shuffling on the Titanic in light of, of climate catastrophe? And to be perfectly honest, this is the reason why I'm pessimistic in general. It is only because of the threat of, of climate change, because I think that the way things are shaping up are fake scarcity um, right now has fueled right wing populism. You know, uh, uh, a few million Syrian refugees coming to Europe and everybody wants to shut the doors and saying that they're going to be drains on the economy and whatnot, which is just objectively not not true. Um, but what if it was true? You know, what if, in other words, there's a uh, hundred million people who need to come into a, a country to save their lives, and and it's the only you know moral and ethical uh, uh, thing to do. But it is going to cause a lot of short-term dislocation. Now, if the narrative of, of, of scarcity works when there's not actually scarcity, how well would this right-wing narrative of scarcity work amid climate apocalypse when when we're um, when when there is actually uh, a, a scarcity. I, I just think that a lot of things are shaping up to be, uh, on the political level at least, to play into the, the benefit of the uh, right-wing populace. And I really need to keep reading a lot of our eco-socialist comrades who are more on the optimistic side of thinking that this will cause people to question capitalism because uh, unplanned capitalism is what got us into this situation. But you know, I, I don't think history actually works that way. It's, it's, you brought us to a bleak place, but I'm going to blame the comments for that. I mean, certainly it's the case it's, it, that it's, it's very hard for me to imagine a path to any kind of meaningful left victory when any part of our slogan involves requiring people to make do with less. And yeah, the, I mean, certainly we live in a world of manufactured scarcity, whether ideologically manufactured or manufactured in the sense that it's a function of distribution. And it is very hard to imagine a liberatory future with uh, with the, the sorts of scarcity that some right. a, a, a more apocalyptic comrades might predict. Yeah, but that's why we need, I mean, if we actually had a uh, green grid and, you know, I don't want to get into the nuclear power debate, but if we had like sources of energy that were, you know, be, be renewable, whatever it was, if, if we, if we, we can, in other words, have growth and still have a massive reduction in, in, in emissions. And obviously we could then make a decision to prioritize growth in the global south and, and, and elsewhere. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm hot now. I spent a summer in, in Delhi. Uh, that's a, definitely a place where more people need ACs. You know what I mean? So when we think about uh, uh, personal uh, you know, consumption and whatever else, like we should also think about the fact that you know, in India, a lot of people need ACs, and also a lot of people never get the chance to leave India. You know, you're born a uh, poor in India, you'll spend your entire life, uh, you'll spend 70, 80 years never leaving India. Like, why shouldn't they have the right to, to fly and, and see the world and see other places too, you know? Um, that, so, in other words, we definitely need a politics that's both anti-scarcity, but that recognizes um, and pro abundance and, and pro human human flourishing in all senses, and that's modernist, but also that recognizes real finite um, uh, limits, and that requires degrees of planning, right? The question is, in our debates that we often have about um, the role of markets and, and whatnot, you know, that's really limited to like the sphere of consumer goods or whatnot. Oh, I think. Viewers, 
I'm for commanding heights. Open markets. Don't let him. I'm not like a central planner here. Don't let him. Um, yeah, it depends. Yes, it's more more nuanced. But anyway, I, I ran very late on the on the talk, so I, I think the one good way to wrap it up and to bring it home isn't really the difficult applications to the to the U.S. Because there's a lot of tactical questions in the U.S. about how do we unite the left with with unions? Um, um, what what are the merits of the rank and file strategy, or sh should that just be a rank and file tactic? Because that's, that's kind of my view, which we need a combination of of approaches that could foster immediate alliances between left wing trade union bureaucracies and the political socialist movement, as well as um, a rank and file reform, um, you know, struggles too, and so on. Um, but I think often when it comes to understanding this history, like understanding the history and trajectory of Swedish social democracy, understand what happened to the Second International, and all these things, we should just sit and think and understand the history on its own terms and let the lessons soak in and inform our, our practice in subtle ways instead of trying to draw one-to-one -one, uh, lessons. I mean, that's what I try to do with that, with, with, with this, with the process of writing my book and kind of getting much deeper into this, this history or even thinking about more far-flung examples like um, revolutions in the third world, like China, like Grenada, like the pink tie processes and whatnot. Often there's not one-to-one -one comparisons, but there are just the cumulative understanding that we're part of a broad movement that has actually accomplished and done a lot across the world. We're part of a socialist movement that has taken power in some form in what, like a third of the world. Uh, for both good and also for for ill, um, you know we're we're not part of this this weak um, movement that you know exists half only on 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 Twitter, uh, and and that's that's the main. La I, so I have no no uh, clear one to one uh, uh, lessons that I drew from this, other than just um, understanding past attempts to organize a, a, a class. Uh, than to administer a state in the broad interests of that that class, and I think that's what we could get at its best from from social democracy. Instead of just reading history backwards and saying that, you know, Tony Blair is an asshole uh, and Sweden is a rightward moving welfare country that's that's seeing its its uh, welfare state actually decay, whatever else, and then looking at it backwards, like let's just like see the actual arc of arc of history on its own terms. I think that's a great place to put this up. All right, well, thanks to everyone for tuning in. I'm sorry I went long. Next time I'm gonna pick, find myself a much smaller topic. I was actually thinking about doing something on the Grenadian Revolution, maybe. I would love maybe. That. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something I got from my uh, from my mother, uh, you know, who's from who's from Trinidad and, and, and kind of used to tell me about Maurice Bishop. Uh, she likes like, Populist strongmen, basically. Bishop was was one of the, the the greatest socialist leaders in in the the Americas, and there's a lot to to get in there. So maybe that's the next one. Something more more manageable, you know, a country of like a hundred thousand people. National liberation, developmental states, just in general, is just third world social democracy. All right, so that's the next one at some point in the future. In the meantime, though, please tune in on Friday. I didn't mention this before. Please press like and subscribe. Uh, we're still growing this presence. You know, three months ago we had like two, three thousand subscribers. Now we have uh, thirty-six, something like that. So uh, we are we are in fact growing, but um, only with your your help. And then obviously check out the magazine. We got that after Bernie issue coming out soon. And thanks to to Asher, one of our good comrades from Verso Books, for for joining us. Thanks as usual to Kale. Uh, Brooks, who's uh, behind the scenes uh, doing the production. And I'll catch you all on Friday.